today we're talking about reset. That is our series. And we're talking about fearless. How in life we can be fearless by fearing less and how important that is. Fear is in our world. 25 years ago, there was a survey done amongst elementary kids. And they were asked basically, what's your top five fears in life? And here's what came up from kids 25 years ago. It was animals, dark rooms, strangers, not stranger things, strangers, high places, and noises. That was the five top things. Well, that same survey was done recently with kids of the same age in the modern era, and this is what their their fears were. Look at this. Parents divorcing, nuclear war, cancer, pollution, being molested or shot. Everybody, fear is on the rise. Fear is real. That's a negative fear, but you know what the truth is? There's some fears, yes, that are negative, but some fears are positive, especially for men. Uh, Man, here's really good advice in the world of fear. I read this recently. Never ask a woman if she's pregnant unless you see an actual baby being born. Even then, act surprised, okay? Yes, men. How many men have ever made that mistake? Okay, do not open your mouth. Think what you want, do not open your mouth, all right? So, hey, fear, that's what we gotta talk about. How how do we reset fear? Talking about reset, this is what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. We talked about Peter and resetting his past and how he recovered from failure. And then last weekend, Pastor Kurt talked about Nehemiah and how he had to reset not only his future, but the future of an entire nation by igniting a dream. And today we're talking about this guy called Gideon and how he had to reset his present by overcoming fear. And we're going to be talking about four battles that he needed to fight in his life. The fourth battle was quite literally a physical fight. He needed to lead the army of Israel against the Midianites. The Midianites at that time, they were coming in, they were ruling and raiding against Israel. And you got to get the context of the book of Judges and of Gideon's life at that time. Judges is like a roller coaster book in the Bible. When there was a good leader, they were up. When there was a bad leader, they were down. And they had more bad leaders than good leaders. And they were without a good leader. And God had to come and speak to Gideon to become that leader. And he said, I want you to fight the Midianites. Why? Because the Midianites, they were coming in as raiders. And every time Israel like grew some crops or harvested something, Midianites would come in and literally rob it from them. God said, I want you to go out and fight these guys. And I would say this, that fight number four, and you can write it in already if you want, it's like this big fighting fear in our world. That's like the big sexy fight that we all want in our lives. We just want to have a legacy moment, a defining moment, where we know that we've given our life to something incredible, where we've helped change the world. We all want to go straight to that fight. But there were three fights before he ever got to the big legacy fight of his life. And that's what I really want to focus on today. So you ready to jump into this, everybody? Well, here we go. It started out with fight number one. What's fight number one? Fight fear by winning what? A battle in my head. A battle in my head. What is between your ears, everybody, will determine everything in your life. And God wants us, like Gideon, to win a battle by winning a battle in our head. So let's read our text here from Judges chapter 6, verses 11 to 15. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Note that, and we're going to come back to that uh, later, because that's a really weird thing to do, to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. If you've got a pen, underline that line. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It's interesting what happens here is that Gideon ignores what God says. He goes, pardon me. He sounds very English. Oh, pardon me, my Lord. And Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Can you hear the disappointment in his voice? He's like a Raiders fan, everybody. He's just like, (laughs) 
<clears throat> almost bitter. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now look what God does with what what Gideon did, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? It was like Gideon ignored God and then God ignored Gideon. And he said, I'm not going to listen to your whining. You're not a whiner. You're a warrior. Get up and fight, son. We're going to do something incredible. And then what does he do? He moans again. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Oh, all the negativity, everybody, that was out there, and all the fear had gotten into his head and into to his heart. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he said these words, powerful words. He said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And thoughts are like the birds of the air. It's negativity that's flying around. It's flying around. I don't care if you watch CNN. I don't care if you watch Fox, the BBC, or any of this stuff. There's a lot of negativity. Presidential races are going to be coming up. Negativity that's flying around. Negativity in our world everywhere, but we don't have to let it get into our head. Because write these things in. Because fear sends my head space to the wrong place. Fear sends my headspace to the wrong place. Look at this. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. You don't do that. That's like trying to play soccer in a baseball field. It just is incompatible, people. Golf on a tennis course, it doesn't work. If you want to thresh wheat, you don't go into a wine press. You crush grapes in a wine press. You thresh wheat in an open field. You get it up into the air. But why was he doing this? Because of fear. Fear in your head sends your whole body to the wrong places. Sends us to the wrong places. You see, sometimes in our minds, we think to ourselves, I don't look the part. I don't have the style. Uh, high schoolers, I don't look cool enough. And so because that fear is in our head, it sends us to a place called Debtville. Are you with me, everybody? We start out with the fear, but we end up in a place where we've got so much debt in our lives. We sit because we think to live in Granite Bay, to live in Loomis, to live in California, to live on the West Coast, we need all of this stuff. And it's add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. And really it is add to misery, add to misery, add to misery, add to misery. Our headspace has sent us to the wrong place. Some of us were in here and we're single. And you know what? We're thinking that we'll never be loved. And that fear in our head sends us to the wrong guy and the wrong girl. And we end up in the wrong place, the wrong relationships with the wrong people. Are you with me, everybody? Where did it all come from? It came from a fear in our head that God is not with us. And we got to do this by ourselves. We, we got a fear in our lives that really no one is ever going to love us. And then what we do is we end up living for people's likes instead of God's love. We end up in the wrong place all of the time. But I love this about God, that where God meets you does not define you. God won't let it define you. He was in the wrong place with the wrong mentality, living with the wrong fears, but God didn't judge him by where he was. God saw a picture of his future, everybody. And that's what God does from you. Next thing is that fear stops us from what? From seeing who God is. The Lord is with you. That's God's promise. God is with you. And I want to encourage you with this today. We got to put on a thing that God says is the helmet of what? You see, your mind is so important, God wants it protected. He said, I realize there is a spiritual battle and your head is key to this. So I've given you a helmet. You would never think of going skateboarding without a helmet, is that right? You would never think of doing, I don't know, uh, leading a middle school group without a helmet. You would never think of doing that, people. You, you need a helmet in life. And God says, why would you try and live your life without my thoughts being locked in and other thoughts being locked out. That's what the helmet of salvation, you're thinking, oh, well, how do I put on this helmet? And you're going to think to yourself, oh, Andrew, you're like a broken record. Who can remember records? 
Hey, it's, it's all the high schoolers want to buy today's vinyls, everybody, okay? I sound like a broken record. I'm going to say this to you. It is January. You can still start it, the Bible in one year. How many people have heard me say this? Pastor Kurt said it last weekend. How many people have downloaded the Bible in one year? Come on, give me a wave. A whole bunch more of you need to do it. I'm going to ask you this here. If you haven't downloaded the Bible in one year, how's your Bible reading going? I bet you it's not going as well as the people who've downloaded the Bible in one year. I had a lady came up to me before 815 service. She said, thank you, Pastor Andrew. I said, I'm a long-term Christian, but I've been struggling with scripture. I downloaded the Bible in one year. I am so energized. I recommend it to family, to friends. A whole bunch of us are reading it together. It is changing my life. Everyone, download the app, get on it. What are you doing? You're putting on the helmet of salvation at that moment. Fear, what does it do in our life? Fear stops us from seeing who we are. This is all in the head. It stops us from seeing who we are. God says to him, mighty warrior, mighty warrior. You gotta know who you are. My, uh, my uh, last boy, Nathan, when he was seven years old, I took him on, on a trip like to the sporting mecca, everybody. I took him to Old Trafford. That is Manchester United soccer ground. 80,000 people there. I'm telling you, Jesus was there in all his glory. It was an amazing experience. So we had a great time uh, worshiping, I mean, sorry, celebrating the team. And, uh, and when we headed off into the city center to stay at the hotel because I was preaching in Manchester the next day, and it was the Hilton hotel and it's a large hotel in the center of Manchester and we were heading we were in the lobby heading towards the elevators and Nathan just turned around and he said dad look I said what is it he said there's a little boy who looks just like me and I went Nathan that is you that's a mirror <laughs> he's looking right at himself didn't recognize himself and I, I, I think that sometimes we, we just don't recognize who we are in Christ. And it was like the angel of the Lord came down to Gideon and he says, I'm holding up a spiritual mirror. You see yourself like this, but I see you like this. You're not this weak wimp, you're a mighty warrior. And that's what God wants to get into our heads. We put the wrong label on ourselves. There's a bike company here in the United States and we're shipping bikes off all across the country, but so many of the bikes were getting uh, damaged in carriage and the company were freaking out. They were losing too much money with this. And so they came out with a really novel plan and they put new packaging on their bikes and it looks like this. They put the screen, a picture of a television on the bike and everyone then carrying it thought they were carrying a television and damage went down by 80%. <laughs> Just with a little bit of relabeling. Look at me, everybody. There's only two people in this world that can label anything. And that is number one, a designer, a designer. I am my house, I have God's will for your life. I have what's called a Dyson. How many people have a Dyson? Oh my goodness, Tran just my, my son says it transforms vacuuming, dad. It transforms, and AirPods. He's a different guy altogether with a vacuum. I got the blade, it's, it's an absolutely remarkable device. Why is it called a Dyson? because the designer was a guy called Sir James Dyson. He had 5,000 prototypes, he came up with the perfect one, and the bagless vacuum, and there we go. It's called a Dyson. I have one in my house, okay? But I don't need to call it a Dyson. I can call it Betsy. I can call it whatever I want. I know I'm not the designer, but I'm the owner, yes? I can call the thing whatever I want. So there's only two people that can label anything in life, and that is the designer or the owner. And look at me, God is both for you. He's your designer and he's your owner, and he's the only one that gets to label you. And right now, even with fear in your life, he is saying you are a mighty warrior in God. You carry the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have the sword of the Spirit in your hand. You've got spiritual gifts in your life. You are dangerous. You are dangerous, everybody, yes. 
But we have so much fear and there's so many issues and deep insecurity is inside of our lives. I heard this story at the end of last year about a guy called David Block. David is a fantastic young man, 21 years old. He has autism and an immunodeficiency thing going on inside of him as well and it doesn't get to go out much and he is a sort of like selective mute. He hasn't spoken all of his life, just has not spoken. And at the end of last year, he finally said his first line. Came out with it. His mom was like, what? He's speaking. And his first line ever was a question. And this was the question he said. First words he's ever said was, would someone like me? Would someone like me? His mom was blown away. One, that he spoke. But two, that his first line would be this, would someone like me? Well, she didn't have a a massive following on Twitter, but she went on Twitter and just, you know, recounted the story and it went viral and everyone started following her. I mean, that night it all just started kicking in and people were going, I would like you, I would like you, I would like, sports stars started weighing in. And basketball players were saying, I would like you and I would like you to come to one of my games. I'm going to take care of you and all of that. He didn't get to bed until 5 a.m. by the time he read all the responses to his mom's tweet. It just blew up. And I think David's actually asking the question that so many of us are asking Would someone really like me? There's fear inside of our lives because we got the wrong label on us. But I'm gonna say this, it's actually the wrong question, not would someone like me, would someone love me? And the answer is yes, and God has proved that through Jesus Christ. He put his arms out and he died for you. God's every thought is for you. Before you were in your mother's womb, you were in the mind of God. He is constantly looking after you. The Lord is with you and you are a mighty warrior. We gotta get these brand new labels on our lives, yes? We gotta get it in. I'm telling you, this whole fighting fear in our head is the number one thing in our lives. Forget the world thing for a moment, we're gonna go there at the end, but we gotta fight fear in our head. Well, after we fight fear in our head, where does it go from there? Oh, to the battlefield. No, 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 no. He said, get out of this wine press and I want you to go to your home because You gotta fight fear and you gotta win a battle in your home. How many parents know what I'm talking about? Come on, everybody. How many people know that the home is a battleground? No, you're all acting a little perfect right now. No one's raising a hand, screaming, going full Southern Baptist. No one's doing it, okay? Let's be honest. The home is a battleground. So God says to him, well, we're working on your head and I want you to take a baby step and I want you to go home and fight a battle of fear in your house. Look what happens here, Judges 6, 25 to 27. Tear down your father's altar to Baal. If you don't know what that is, that means an idol, that means boo. And cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar. Everyone would say proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Now I really like this here, underline this. He said, but because he was afraid of his family and townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. How cool is that, everybody? I just like that sort of, that's reassuring. So what he was saying is, God, I'm gonna fight this battle in my head. This is what I find in life. The battle of fear in my head is not something where one day I can just put a flag in the ground and go, hey, at age 37, I won a battle over fear and I've never feared since. All I know is that I take a step over fear with faith, but fear follows. How many people know that in life? It's not like fear just disappears. Fear's always around there. The bird's in the air, but I'm not gonna let it nest in my head. But fear is always flying around. And so what he did was he fought the battle in his head, but the fear of his family was very real. But he said, you know what? I'm gonna feel the fear and I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna tear down the altar, I'm gonna build up the altar, but you know what, just to be safe, I'm gonna do it at nighttime (laughs) when no one's looking. But he did it anyway, yes? Kudos to him, he's gonna do it anyway. Winning battles at home involves two things. Just like him, number one is this, tearing stuff down, and that takes humility. Some of you know, and I know, that in our homes, there's altars 
that have been raised up, that have been established, that are respected, but they are negative. They're like idols in our homes. They're wrong. They're attitudinal alters in our home. They're a coping mechanism. We call it rackets in psychology of just things that have happened for years that we dance around, manipulation, silence, violence, okay, in our lives. It's just controlling it. And you know what? I, I just want to encourage you with this. At the beginning of a year, and I think this whole thing of decade is resonating in me. How many people want to perpetuate lies and fear into the future? I don't want to do it. I want to speak to parents here. Parents, let's have the courage not to blame the kids for the way the house is and the way the world is. Come on, parents. Let's take ownership of our house. Let's what? Humble ourselves. It takes humility to do this. To actually acknowledge that something is wrong. Sir, can I say to you, will you stop worrying about, you know, oh, this is my kingdom. Your home is not your kingdom to be worshipped. The home is your kingdom to serve in. If you're trying to fight about who is the boss of this house, you've lost the fight a long time ago. You're called to be the chief servant in your house. That's what God has called you to do. It's not about who's the boss of this home. Who's going to be the servant of this home? How can I serve my house? And, and this is why, well, we'll talk about this in a second. And the, and the next thing is, look at this here. It's not only that we've got to tear stuff down, but we've got to build stuff up. And how do you build stuff up? You build stuff up with honor. Humility tears things down. Humility says, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to deal with this. I'm at the heart of the issue. I'm going to take responsibility. And how do you build things up? You turn around and you start to honor in life. It's like a really smart thing. We don't have the verse here, but uh, uh, high schoolers, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 15, it's like the second rendition of the Ten Commandments. And basically, the Lord says to his people, he said, honor your father and your mother. And he said, why would you do that? So that you may live long, i.e. they won't kill you. And uh, secondly, secondly, uh, that it might go well with you. Can I just say this? In life, I don't care if you're 14 or 44, if your parents are still alive, it's a really smart thing to honor them. I find this in life. Honor doesn't mean agree. There's going to be lots of differences between generations. But God says this, you know what? They are your parents. Learn to honor them. And I know there's not perfect parents. And maybe for some people in this room, you've been in a situation where there's been abusive parents. And we're not all asking you to honor sin or anything wrong in that sense. But if it's just a little bit of a disagreement, God says, still honor and give respect. Honor is so important. Honor opens doors. Honor elevates. We had a knock at our door um, just last week, a knock at the door, and Isabel went and answered the door, and she came in, and she was blown away. She thought it was just like standard, you know, Amazon Prime. The kids have ordered something again. Aren't our kids great with Amazon? They really are, just keeping the economy going. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, but, but it wasn't your standard Amazon delivery. Isabel looked down and it was a beautiful candle and there was a little note on it. And it's from a girl who's actually in the service. I won't embarrass her by saying her name, Abby. And, um, <laughs> and she, she, uh, she had delivered a candle on the day of her 18th birthday. And there was a little note on it and it said, I just wanted to thank you with this small gift for being part of my 18 years of life on this planet and helping me become the person that I am today. This is a kid who's 18, not going to houses to get presents, but is giving presents. Let me tell you, not only do I want that girl in my life, I wanna give her a job. Do you know what I'm saying, everybody, oh yes? You see, honor opens doors for you. When you turn around and you say, I'm ready to give that honor in life. It's this balance of humility and it's this balance of honor. When I humble myself, when I let go of hubris in my life, and actually I learn to honor, it changes everything. I was always given the advice in life. You've got to learn to get under the things that are over you so that you can get over the things that are under you. More coffee, please, for everybody right now. More coffee. <laughs> Going that, that sounded Irish with a Guinness. That really did. <laughs> and speaking of that, 
Conor McGregor, everybody. All right, I'm going to throw that in. Did you hear it? 40 seconds, <laughs> 40 seconds. yes. <laughs> I was going to say something there. I won't. Okay. <laughs> so you got to get under the things that are over you to get what? Over the things that are, I, I just simply, God says, you know what? Humble yourselves in some areas of life and I'll raise you up in other areas. Yes? This home thing is so important. Do you know for four weeks in February, we're going to be doing this series, What Happy Families Know. And this is not like, you know, a, a really awkward segue. People, you know what you need to do? You need to put out these four weekends for February and say, we will not miss this. Single parents come, married people come, singles come. If you're thinking of building a family, you need to hear this. Kids come. This is what we're talking about. And some of us already, like, when you look at that, it's like a sense of guilt rises in your life and you're thinking, oh, we're such a disaster, our family. That's why we're here, everybody. We're all in the same boat. We're all in recovery. Make sure and come to this. So the first fight is fighting fear and winning a battle in our head. The second one is fighting fear and just taking it straight home, not to the big battlefield, bringing it home. And the next one is fighting fear, and winning a battle when my cried. And I'll not read all of this, but it's a simple story. Suddenly he starts to overcome Gideon, starts to overcome fear. Faith starts to rise in his life. And this is what he does. He scrambles a crowd and he gets them together. And 32,000 guys say, we'll fight with you. And God says, you know what? You need to get rid of some of those guys. Now just tell them that if anyone's heart is fearful, if anyone's heart is trembling, you can go. And guess what happened at that moment? 22,000 left. And for the journey that God has for your life and for my life, listen to me, we got to have all types of people in our lives. But you know what you need? You need some people that are faith-filled in your life, not fear-filled. There's enough fear in this world without me following people of fear. I gotta have people that are gonna speak faith into my life. So God says, we gotta bring down the numbers. And he said, 10,000 is still too many. And he's like, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, you know what? I wanna get glory for my name. And if they win, they'll accept the glory. I wanna work a miracle. I wanna thin the herd out. And this is what I find in life. This is what, especially as I get a little older, I'm finding this, that I need to be wise in who I select as friends. I need quality friends and not perfect friends because I will never be a perfect friend. But the Bible does speak well of friendship. Look at these verses from Proverbs. It says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for what? adversity. And, and this is important. We're going to talk about this in a second. You need people in your life that are going to walk through the hard times with you. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. I have a simple question. When was the last time you had a friend that just got in your face? They didn't just like your picture on Instagram, but actually had a look at you and said, what are you smoking? What are you on at this moment in time? Instead of looking for all the people just giving you kisses and hugs, who actually gets in your face? And Greg Rochelle says this, it's almost impossible to live the right life with the wrong friends. This one here, born for adversity, when you have actually got a friend in your life that you need, I had a pastor that called me on Monday morning. Isabel and I were in the car and we were driving and coming back from the poor choice. If you've not been to the poor choice, you need to go to the poor choice. It's incredible, everybody. And, uh, and we were driving back, a phone call came through, saw his name and said, yeah, well, let's take the call. And he, he, he said, I, I just need to talk to a friend. I said, what, what's happened? He said, a kid in our church just took his life. I just left the hospital and I just needed to speak to somebody. I need friends in our lives that bring comfort, but bring encouragement at those moments. How many people have ever been to Makuni? You ever been to Makuni? Yes, Makuni. You've never been to Makuni. Don't worry, you will get it in heaven. I'm sure of that. You will get it in heaven. 
if you don't get the experience. But, but, but Taro owns uh, Makuni, and he, he's, he's an incredible guy. And he has a really good friend. He's like his best friend in the world is a guy called Faras. And um, it's amazing. For, he, uh, Taro's from Japan. Faras is originally from Syria, then Lebanon, and has had his life here for years. Really good guy. Very, very close. Years ago, they best friends. They were celebrating their birthdays, and they got back into town. And Faraz says, I just don't feel really good. I don't, I don't feel just great. And Taro said, oh, you ate so much when we were eating today. That's what your problem is. In the middle of the night, Faraz calls Taro, and he says, you know what? I'm here in the hospital. Things are not good. And he was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of cancer. And the doctor said, you're finished. You've probably got about six weeks. Probably six weeks. And then there was a little bit of an olive branch held out and said, well, there's a place, I think it was over in Texas, that if you go there, maybe some of that might help, but we really not holding out a chance. You know what Taro did? He got on the plane with them. He flew with them, got him into the hospital, stayed the first week of treatment. He said, obviously, I've got to get back to my family, my business, but I make you this pledge that I will pray for you every single day at 6 a.m. in the morning. 6 a.m. in the morning, and then I will also send you a verse of the day every single day I'm going to do you. How many people think that sounds like a friend? Well, that's the first pledge. And then he said this to him, says, when it comes to chemotherapy, I'm going to walk with you as well through that. And this is what Taro did, everybody. This is what he did. Yes. When one lost his hair, he shaved his hair off. How many people would like a friend like that? Would you like a friend like that? Well, the big question is, how many people would like to be a friend like that? That's the big question. In life, I'm telling you this here, before we head out into the big battle, the one that we're coming to, this big battle of changing the world, these ones are the important ones. I gotta know in life that I'm continually battling the battle of fear in my head. I gotta fight the battle of fear in my head. I gotta keep fighting the battle of fear in my house and not be scared in my own house. And you know what too? I gotta find the right people in my life because when I get all of that in order, I'm ready to fight big battles in the world. Are you ready for this? Point number four, just write it in real simple. Fight fear by winning a battle in my world. You know what he says? He says these words. He says, watch me before he, before the end, sorry, at the beginning of the story, he's going, don't watch me, hide me, I'm away, no one look at me. Watch me, and he says, and follow my lead. I like this, follow my lead. Isn't this a total transformation in his life? A complete transformation. You see, the size of your brain, that's genes. But the size of your heart, that's you. You see, at the beginning of the story, he had a heart and it had XS written on it. It was extra small, extra small. It was all shriveled with fear. It was just basically in survival mode. Let's just keep this little bit of, you know, uh, barley. Let's just keep it together. And just everything was just like small, 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 small. But by the end of the story, his heart was XXL. It had grown hugely. Why? Because he was making this journey from fear to faith. He was starting to trust actually what God was saying. And do you know what? Fear is contagious, but so is faith. The faith is contagious. And he'd gathered these guys around him. He'd got the right crowd in his life. And he was beginning to speak faith in their life. Why? Because he had fought a battle in his head. He had won a fight in his home. He got the right people around him meaning that he could do something in the world around him. MLK weekend is so important, so important for the nation of America. It's actually important for Ireland as well. You know, Martin Luther King inspired a lot of people in the north of Ireland to do with civil rights and to try and do it in a peaceful manner. But we owe so much to this guy, and we know him. Last week we talked about Nehemiah igniting a dream, and we know him because of his great march on Washington. Some of you may even remember it. You may have been alive. It was before my time. But that speech, we know it. Every high schooler would know it, of when he talks about, I have a dream. Do you know that that part of the speech was not in the original script? 
Let me tell you about that day. They were nervous about numbers, but the numbers turned up en masse. Martin Luther King, he was the last speaker in the day, not because they were saving the best to the last. The other speakers had put their name down first, thinking that their clips would meet or would, be, would make the evening news that night. <laughs> they put Martin on at the end, didn't think he would make the news. Well, did he make the news, everybody? Did he make the news? And he was a little bit like tense about his speech and he just held off on it for quite a while. He submitted some notes at the very end of the night, they were typed up, but it didn't have the I have a dream moment in it. Martin gets up there and you can watch it on YouTube. He delivers it with his normal poise and excellence. He's just an incredible communicator. And what you can't hear, but off to the side is the voice of a woman. Her name was Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer that had sang that day. And she's off to the side and she knew Dr. King very well. And she had heard him before on a couple of occasions just speak a little bit about having a dream. And she shouts out in the middle of his speech. He thinks he's about to finish his speech. History says it's about to begin. Because she shouts out and she says, Martin, tell them about the dream. Tell them about the dream. And it was like something in his head just went, listen to that woman, you better listen to that woman. And he lifts up from his notes and he says, I have what? A dream. I have a dream. I want to care. Oh Lord. Can, it, can anyone hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? The voice of the Holy Spirit saying to you today, you weren't just born to hide in a hole. You weren't born for no one to ever see your gifts and your talents. You weren't born to be scared of your own home. You weren't born, excuse me, to live with losers. You were born because God put you on this planet to live a dream, to push through the hard times, to fight real battles, real battles in your own head every day, real battles with your family. It's not always easy. Real battles for the right company because why? All of that stuff is worth going through because you want to win victories in this world for the kingdom of God. Do you know that faith has two words? Faith has two words. Sorry, fear has two words. And it's what if? Fear is just driven by this. What if no one turns up? What if no one listens to me? What if no one buys my book? What if no one looks at my painting? What if no one listens to my voice? What if no one comes along? What if people laugh at me? That's what fear says all the time. What if, what if, what if, what if? Do you know the faith is two words? You know what they are? What if? What if God does come through? What if too many people turn up? What if we get too much money in? What if we can change a generation? What if this dream that God has given me does come true? You see the difference, everybody? I don't think it's a point in life where we're fearless, we're living without any fear, but I do think there's a point in life where we can fear less. Yes, where we can get the dial on fear and turn it down and start directing it towards the world of faith, amen? We can start doing that in our lives. Don't ask with fear, what if? Start asking with faith, what if, amen? I want you to stay in your seats. It's important. We're going to pray. Would you mind closing your eyes and bowing your head? Some of you in this room, you're saying, I have these fears in my life and they are very real. But can I encourage you on a positive fear? There's a positive fear. It's called the fear of God. And that's not a, oh my goodness, I'm so scared of God. That is, I honor God with my life and the one that's, most important to me is God himself. And if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, if 
you're here and you're saying, I, I want to give more than my fears to God. I want to give my whole life to God. I want to have a relationship with him. I'm going to pray a prayer and you can just pray that prayer with me. And that helps you start a relationship with God, a living relationship. So I'll say the words and you just repeat them. Are you ready? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you want to be my savior. And today, Lord, would you become my savior? Would you become my Lord and my God? Jesus, would you take away my sin and give me your forgiveness? And I pray, Lord, take away fear in my life, the fear of man, and give me faith today. I put my faith, I put my trust in you.